portion, verses 22 to 71, and we're going to cover all of those verses today. We're going to incorporate the scripture reading along with the message. Um, and we're doing a couple of new things today as well, so this will be kind of fun, and it's God's blessings, actually. So I have the, the presentation up here. Oh, now I just went upside down. I sure hope it turns around on me again. Hello. Thank you. Um, I shouldn't have shown you. I messed it up. And I thought I'd really uh, make this exciting. Hi. Just be open and honest and everything, right, Mark? I opened up my Bible, and I realized I left my sermon notes at home. Anyways, so, so here we go. I got what you got, okay? Um, anyways, so, so this is God's, God's gift to me to, to have my presentation right in front of me instead of me having to go like this all the time. Anyways, but I think I'm, I let my presentation be kind of light this time, too. So this is going to be really fun. Um, so let's go ahead and pray. No, we're good. Um, so let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness to us. I'm grateful for your word. It is that which is true and quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It's not our words. It's not anything we say, Lord. It's your breath speaking through these who you have ordained over the ages to specifically declare your truth to us, that we might read it and to know who you are and what you desire from us. And then, Lord, even as we go forth, you've told us not to worry about what we're going to say in a day because you'd put the words in our mouth. And so we just rejoice in you for that because you alone, again, are God. And it's your words that are truly the words of life, as we're going to see this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. I need to have the, uh, the clicker. See, having it here, I'm thinking, oh, I've got the presentation here. I can just touch it, but it's not. It's a Zoom one. So I still have to use this in order for that to change. This is too cool. Technology at its finest. Okay, so um, so as we've gone through um, John's gospel, um, the gospel according to John, we have considered the fact that that Jesus is the Son of God, right? That he became the Lamb of God in order to take away the sins of the world. And last week we saw or mentioned that that was core to the um, to the gospel message. That reality is you have to believe that in order um, to to come to know Christ. In um, two weeks ago, um, this is natural, so I'm going this way, even though it's right there. Anyways, two weeks ago, David taught on the feeding of the multitude, and then Jesus walking out of the water. And we mentioned the fact that Jesus is continually seeking to get the people to focus on the spiritual rather than the physical. And that's what we're going to see again as we come into today. One more um, housekeeping, and that is talking about what we did last week. So there was a lot of information last week, and I apologize for that plane just kind of coming down like a Harrier. What is, what's, that, what's the Marine one? The Harrier? You know, it's kind of, I, I, that's my messages a lot of times. I kind of take off like a Harrier, and I come in like a Harrier. You know, it's like there's no, no, no warnings. Just, we just kind of come in. And so last week was even more so. And so what I want to do right away here real quick is just summarize it because we're not going to deal with this stuff as we come through John 6 today, okay? Um, so, but what we saw was in Jesus talking about both the work of God and the will of God, and when he's talking about the work of God, um, he's putting it as opposing to the word pistuo or to believe, okay? And we saw pistis is the word faith. And so they want to know, what work should we do? And Jesus says to them, well, this is the work of God, even that you believe, right? And so um, the work of God, it is God who has done the work of salvation. By his grace, he has made me, has made the way for us to come to him through faith. What verse is that? What verse did we look at last week that we went to? That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9, right? It's by grace that you're saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God, right? So it's God who does the work um, in this, right? By his grace, he's made me, made the way for us to come through him through faith. Believing was not viewed by Christ then as a work. Rather, he viewed it as a responsibility of man, of man to believe. And so he stated, this is the work of God that you what? Believe. And we're going to see that again over and over and over and over again as we come through this. Because again, through this whole passage, Jesus is going to be dealing with these people on, you're thinking like the world, you're thinking earthly, you need to change the way you think. Okay. And so there's nothing to do with your work, it has everything to do with God's work. All you have to do is 
believe, okay? But then we went into the will of God, and we talked about the word "thelo" a lot, and I brought in the, the, the term bule and bulamai very, very briefly when we were looking at Romans 9, and I challenged you to do a study on it. I did last week as well and told you to look up all those words, see if I was telling you the truth, that bule is a synonym of "thelo." But what we see is God desires, this is 1 Timothy chapter 2, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. It is he who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That's Ephesians chapter 1. No one can come unless God draws him. That's John 6. Jesus said that, okay? And he draws all men to himself through the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. So last week, we talked about the word helkuo, which is the word to draw. In John 6, Jesus says, no one can come unless the Father draws me. And the Calvinists use that as this concept of predestination. But I shared in John chapter 12, Jesus said that if the Son of Man be lifted up, he will draw Helkuo, all men to himself. So you, if you're going to be consistent, and you need to be consistent in your translation, and you're going to say that this is a, a, a dragging be, without your, even this, your own uh, will being involved, then, then you have universal salvation in John chapter 12. And so you clearly don't have predestination in John 6 and universal salvation in chapter 12. What you actually have is what Jesus talked about in John 14 and John 16. And that is that's the Holy Spirit, that it was profitable for the believers for him to leave. For when he left, he would send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would guide him into all truth and that he would convict the world of righteousness, judgment, and sin. And that's the job of the Holy Spirit. And so we see that as well in Romans 1. I didn't get to share all this. This is where we're landing the plan. You know? And then also as well in all that, with that convicting work, I didn't even have it on the slides, but this is kind of a free throw in. That's why Jesus also declared that you can blaspheme Jesus. You can blaspheme the Father and it can be forgiven you. But there's one sin that's an unpardonable sin. What is it? You can't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit that draws you to God. It's he who does the convicting work. It's he who convicts you of sin. And if you reject that and you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, there is no other, no other hope for you. So it's the Holy Spirit that draws you by the plan, the work, the will of God the Father in order for you to come to faith in God the Son, in order that you might glorify God the Father. Now, I understand that we can we glorify God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But in the hierarchical chain, if you would, as we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it's God the Father who is the top. And so he sent the Son in order to be the Savior of the world. The Son goes back to be the Father, and he sends the Holy Spirit, in order to lead us and, and to remind us of all his teachings. Okay, so, so we're not going to talk about that anymore, okay, as we come through. Now we're going to talk about the bread of life and the word of life, okay, as we come through here. And so we're going to deal with this in five sections as we come through it, and you're not going to hear me have my two points, the bread of life and the word of life. It, they're just going to be incorporated within it. In fact, almost all of this is all about Jesus being the bread of life, okay? And at the very end is where we're going to talk about the fact that Jesus has the words of life, but first, we have this situation, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we've spent time on this with um, David's teaching and then even mentioning it last week. But the situation is the fact in verses 22 down. So if you have, have this, this is where we're going to do the scripture reading. So verses 22 down to 26 it says, on the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got in the boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? But Jesus answered them, saying, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. So, feeding of the 5,000 just happened. The people were sitting there waiting for Jesus because he went up onto the mountain to pray. They got the next morning. Jesus was missing. They can't figure it out because they knew the disciples went away on their own. 
but nobody saw Jesus come back down the mountain. Nobody saw Jesus leave. Where did he go? So they all decide to scatter. They go back to Capernaum. Okay, and apparently they go to the synagogue because we're going to see that this is exactly where this is playing out. Jesus is having the interaction in the synagogue. Okay, and so they go into the synagogue and lo and behold, who's standing in the synagogue? Jesus. And they're like, how did this happen? Where did you come from? And Jesus doesn't even play into it. As we mentioned last week, he hits it directly into it and goes to this exhortation. And that is, guys, you're, you're only seeking me, not because you saw the signs, but because I fed you. And now you want more, you want more bread. And so he gives them this, this exhortation here that we see at the beginning of verse 27. He says, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. He says, stop, stop. Change the way you think. Change the way you're acting. Quit working for that which is going away. Start laboring for that which doesn't go away. So Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21, Jesus tells us to lay up treasures where? In heaven. Why? Where the moth and the rust do not destroy nor corrupt, right? Rather, or, so don't lay up treasures on earth where the moth and rust do corrupt, but rather lay up your, your treasures in heaven where the moth and rust do not corrupt. And then he goes on and he talks about your, your eye. Does anybody remember what he talks about with your eye in that passage? Nope, not at all. That's Matthew chapter 7. Let's go back there, Matthew chapter 6, okay? Because this is exciting stuff when Jesus is talking about this, this worrying part. We're not going to read all the way down, okay? But I'll start at verse 19, and we'll read into verse 22. It says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break into steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. God is that which is spiritual, if you would, right? Eternal. Okay, we're going to talk about that in a moment. But mammon is that which money buys. Those are things which are temporal, physical, right? Earthly. And so Jesus says, you got to choose one or the other. So if you're laying up your treasures on the earth, you're not what? Laying up your treasures in heaven. If you're heavenly minded, so you have Colossians chapter three, verse one and two there on your sermon note sheet as well. You can look at that and it talks about seek the things which are above, right? It says, so if you are, if you are focused on the heavenlies, then you're not going to be distracted by the what? The earthlies. So if your eye, if your eye, if that which brings a twinkle to your eye is earthly, then what is it? It's darkness. Yeah, if, if, if darkness is what's in the earth and light is that which is of heaven. And so if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that what? Darkness. You've been, you've been saved by God's grace. At least he died for you. But if you are still earthly minded, then you're missing so much of what God has for you. And so Jesus tells these guys, look, you need to stop laboring for the bread, which is what? It's going away. It's perishing. But rather for the food which endures to everlasting life. So my challenge to you right off the bat is, as we go into this, what are you laboring for? Where are your energies? This word labor is the same word for work that we just saw a moment ago um, where Jesus said, this is the work of God. And so now he talks about us working. This is part of that Ephesians 2 verse 10 part, right? What are you working for? What are you laboring for? Are you laboring merely for what you have on this earth? If you are, 
you're missing it. You're missing so much more than what God has for you. But are you working for that food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will what? Will give you. That's a what? It's a promise. He wants to give it to us. The question is, do we want it? Do we want it more than we want the things of the world? Therefore, you cannot serve two what? Two masters. Change the way you think. Okay? So we move then into this illustration that Jesus is going to, um, to give because the transition is verse 28 it says, then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus said to him, this is the work of God that you what? That you believe. And then he continues on in beginning at verse 30, where we read, therefore, they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Duh. What did he just do? He fed 5,000 plus people with how many loaves of bread? How many? Five loaves of bread and what? Two fish. Well, at least he had two fishes too. I mean, it was just five. I might, I might think something, but he had two fish with it. Come on, five loaves of bread and two fish. And he fed 5,000 plus people in what? How much leftovers? 12 baskets. They had more leftovers than what they started with. Do you get it? That's, that's the intent of that. There was more left over than they actually started with. And yet they're asking what? For a sign. Why do you think they're asking for a sign? Yeah, but Jesus just told them, yeah, you're only looking for me because, not because you saw the what? Sign, but because I fed you. So now all of a sudden they're acting what? Spiritual. Oh, so, so what sign are you going to show us? Duh, you guys are killing me. Do you ever think that way when you're talking to somebody and, and you're thinking about their logic, you know, or their lack thereof? How many times do people think that about you? Anyway, so <laughs> we won't go there, you know, okay? And, and I mean, I get it. There are sometimes I sit there and I go, oh, I can't believe it. And then there's sometimes I know I'm talking to somebody and somebody's looking at me and I'm, I am not getting this, you know? And I'm thinking, oh, I hate when the shoe's on the other foot, you know? But Jesus, I mean, I just, I, 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 I picture Jesus in this moment wanting to find a good doorpost and bang his head against it, okay? And it says, what sign will you perform then that we may see and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Moses, surely I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst but i said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe all that the father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me i will by no means cast out for i have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So Jesus first talks about this earthly bread, or at least they do, because they're asking for a sign, right? And he says, well, you know, and he says, well, our fathers had manna, in the wilderness, right? They were given this bread. Well, did they mention that Moses gave it to them? No, they don't mention it. But again, Jesus knows what? Knows their thoughts, knows their hearts, knows their intent. And so they have venerated Moses, like Moses is the pre-incarnate Messiah, right? And so anybody who's going to be Messiah is going to be gauged against 
Moses, right? And so Jesus immediately cuts to the quick again. and says, wait a second, you guys, you're missing it. The provider was God, not Moses. Think about it. This provision was a, a miracle. Where do you think this stuff came from? Why is it even called manna? What is it? They had no idea. It was like a little coriander seed kind of stuff. And they, you know, they, da, 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 and they knew that, what they could do with it. And if they gathered too much on any particular day, what would happen with it the next day? It would rot and turn into maggots. But if they, if they gathered too much on Friday, which they were supposed to do, they were supposed to gather too much, what happened to it on the Shabbat? Nothing. It was preserved. That's exactly right. They got to eat it. Isn't this an amazing thing? It was a miracle. It was a miracle the entire thing. How long did they get manna? until God provided them food in the land, 40 years. Now, we always talk about 40 years, but, and that's true, but until God provided in another manner. What else did they get in the wilderness? Now, we're talking about the bread, but what else did they get in the wilderness? Quail. How often? Every evening. How long? 40 years. When's the last time you had quail? Anyways, we won't go there. So think about it. How many quail, I'm a math guy, okay? How many quail do you think it took to feed a million and a half people for one day? Is anybody, how many of you have ever had quail? Brazos, you never had quail? I was going to say, I was going to wait for your hand to go. You've had, so Donald, how much quail did you eat? You probably ate a couple. Oh, you probably did. <laughs> I'm messing with you. Okay, but, but they're little. They're little. You're going to eat at least one, right? But let's say you were not big meat eaters, because they probably weren't big meat eaters. Okay, you'd probably eat what? One. One. And there's how many people? Math Keep the math simple. Thank you very much. There's one and a half million people. Now, I know some of those were kids, and they probably weren't eating as much. Yeah. they're probably eating a little less. So we're going to reduce it. We're going to say a million quail, just a million. When's the last time you saw a million quail? Every day for 40 years. And they blew in. Think about it. It wasn't like they had to go out in the woods. Brazos, you, ever, you went quail hunting, right? You, did you hang out in the parking lot and they just, they blew into you? It's how it works. It's exactly how it works. That's why you only went once. And so <laughs> if it happened that way, we'd go a lot, wouldn't we? I mean, we'd have nets filling the freezers up, you know? Think about it. What, what are you going to show us? Our fathers had bread. Like, this is just like a little trite thing. Is that what you calculate? 15, you calculate it? 15 billion quail over that? That's... 14.6 billion quail. <laughs> and so they predominantly ate more bread. Could you imagine how much manna was on the ground? Was, was it like, did you ever be up north and you have like a, a, a snow frosting where it's not like five inches of it, but it's kind of like just about an inch or less. And it's just kind of in every place you walk, you see the crunch, crunch, crunch. I always think, was, was the manna like that? This was a miraculous moment that the people lived every single day. They walked out of their tent, and there was a miracle in front of them. But what do we know about what happened with that miracle? The people what? They got used to it. The provision of God became a complacent moment, and they began to grumble about the provision of God. They lost sight. They began to think earthly, physical, temporal, self-centered, if you would. We're tired of this stinking bread. Well, it's only stinking because you're keeping it to the next day. But anyways, but we're tired of the stinking bread. We want something else. Isn't that amazing to think about? 
but I put myself there and I realized that, you know what, I'm no different than the Israelites and how easy it is for me to grumble and whine and complain about what God has given to me. But Jesus then brings the analogy and he brings it back to the spiritual and says, guys, you're missing it. You're thinking earthly again. You need to think heavenly, spiritual, eternal. God is the one who is the giver of eternal bread, bread of life, and that is me. I am the bread of life. I'm the one who's going to sustain you because they're like, wow, give us this bread. We want this bread. You guys are missing it. You're staring me in the face and you're still missing it. How many times? Hopefully you have quiet time every day. I'm going to assume you have quiet time every morning. You wake up, you set your alarm, so you get up and you read God's word every day. How often is it we read God's word and we miss the life that is just pouring out of the page? And all we see is black ink on a page. Unless you're reading words of Jesus, then it's red ink on a page, which should tell you that it really there should be some vibrancy coming out of that moment, right? But how many times we miss it? Because we're looking at the earthly. We're distracted by the, the, the fleshly. We're distracted by the, the, the temporal. I know that I have to instantly get up and I got to go and I got to do things. And so now all of a sudden, I'm not thinking of what God's speaking to me anymore. I'm thinking about everything else that's going on. And that's these individuals. They're all wrapped up in what they're going to eat for their next meal. When's the last time? Don't put your hand up. Don't tell me. When's the last time you fasted? Really fasted, like no food. Because you really just wanted to read God's word. You missed breakfast. You missed lunch. You missed supper because you were so enthralled in studying God's word that it was more important to you than going for that cup of coffee. Wow, I can't believe, wow, I don't have, I got to get to work. I don't have time for breakfast, but you know, I'm so full right now. That's what Jesus is talking about. If you come to me, you'll never hunger again. And you'll never thirst. Now that's talking physically, but he's talking what? Spiritually. He's talking spiritually, but it's amazing how the spiritual overrides the physical. If you've never experienced it, I challenge you to make Christ your priority and to ask him, ardently ask him to help you change the way you think, that you would begin to think spiritually, not physically, that you would want him more than you want anything else. I think of David. In Psalm 63, oh God, you are my God. Early or earnestly will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee. I long for thee as in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. I walked in some of those wilderness of Judah in that, that barren land where there was only a water hole here and there. Marsh and I spent a day when we were over there many, many moons ago walking an entire day in the Negev in the desert where there wasn't any water. You better know where the oasis is. And David says, I want you more than I want water when I'm walking in a place like that. Would that describe your relationship with Christ? That you want him more than you want the earthly in any shape or form. The illustration is about this bread of life that we're having. But Jesus says then, he who comes shall never hunger or thirst. He who comes shall not be rejected. Jesus says he'll no, no, he will bend no wees by no means cast them out. Do you know what this means? You can't lose your salvation. Isn't that kind of cool? If you're really saved, and I say if you're really saved, okay, because like Colossians 1, we didn't go to, I think it was verse 23, 
okay? And I don't want to be the spoiler and the, the throw the wet blanket on everything we're doing this morning, because it says at the very end of all these things that Christ has done for us, if you continue in the gospel which you've received. The point is, Hebrews chapter 3 says, you know that you become a partaker of Christ if you hold fast till the end, okay? So if you lose your salvation, what that really means is you never had it because he will not cast you away. When you come to Christ, it's on Christ's honor. Think about this. It's not your honor. It's Christ's honor to hold you fast to the day of redemption. Ephesians chapter 1 says he places the Holy Spirit in us as a seal, as the guarantee. What kind of guarantee is it? If you can't, if he can't even hold you from you. How cool is that? Finally, he who comes shall have everlasting life. If you have come, honestly come to Christ, at this very moment, you have everlasting life. You can't kill me. How cool is that? You can stop this tent from being existing on the earth, but you can't kill me. You can't touch me. All you can do is give me an early transition, or at least from the world's perspective, an early transition to what I'm yearning for anyway. Again, I love telling people, how are you? I'm doing great. If it could get any better, I'd be dead. What? I mean, I don't know if you heard me say that before, but if you haven't, you might've looked at me and go, like, oh, it can't be that bad. It can't be that bad. I used to drive a truck and they're not expecting a truck driver to be the, 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 the evangelist, you know? Anyways, no, you didn't listen to me. Listen to me one more time. I'm doing great. If I was doing any better, I'd be dead. No, man, it can't be that bad. It's because you're thinking physically. You're not thinking spiritually. No, dude, I'm doing great. I'm not depressed. I'm not down. I'm excited. I'm alive, awake, alert, enthusiastic, man. But I know where I'm going to go when I die. And the worst thing this world thinks it can do to me is the best thing this world can do to me. Because when I die, I get to go be with Jesus. In this fleshly part of me that struggles with sin and struggles with selfishness and judgmentalism and everything else, guess what? It's not going with me. Yeah, the U-Haul stays behind, baby. And I'm excited about it. Because I get transformed, changed. This mortal will put on immortality. This corruptible, I can't even comprehend how it's going to put on incorruption. This selfish individual is going to be really, really Christ-focused. Can you comprehend that? I don't think you really can. We try, and we try to get a wrap around it a little bit, but I, I think that we are so warped sometimes in our brain. I know Jesus came in and he cleansed me and he kind of straightened things out and I get that. And so therefore I can start even, I can even be talking about this right now. Cause honestly, before I got saved, I wouldn't be talking about this because it didn't even enter my brain. But what that's going to be like. And so I appreciate it. Even this morning, Colossians one, Gerard, you bring it up about the garden and getting our, our brains thinking about that with the peace of God and how that was, because that just gives me another end of this thing just to marvel over because that's it man i i just when i read adam about adam and eve and jesus coming or jesus it was jesus the incarnate presence of god walking and fellowshipping with them in the garden i can't comprehend that how cool would that be anybody who comes has everlasting life well this caused a problem First of all, with the Jews, some consternation here because it just wasn't making sense to them. So verse 41, then the Jews, the Jews then complained, murmured, um, grumbled, literally, about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from, from heaven? So I'm going to read down to 41. Then Jesus answered, therefore answered and said to them, do not murmur against yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent 
me draws him and I will raise him up the last day. It is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the father except he who is from God. He has seen the father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The offense was Christ's humanity. They heard Jesus. Jesus said he was the bread of life. And he, and he came from where? He came from heaven, right? So that's you prior to Jesus, coming to know Jesus, right? And, and you see this guy. I'm standing here in front of you. Just bring it into today. Justin, I came from God directly. I proceed. Justin's starting to think what? Okay, this guy is a quack. So just put yourself in that position. This is what Jesus is saying, right? And they, they turn around and they say what? Isn't this Jesus? I mean, isn't this the guy who grew up in Nazareth? Don't we know about his father and his mother? Isn't his father Joseph the carpenter? I mean, who is this guy? Marcia and I were talking about this probably about a week ago or whatever it was. And she was wondering as she was reading it, and, and I don't have an answer for it. What did Joseph and Mary put out about Jesus? Did, did they just not answer the questions or did they just say that Jesus was Joseph's son? It kind of makes you wonder, and I don't have an answer for it. I don't have an answer for that. Okay, but we do know who Jesus is. Does that make sense? And there's a confusion then for people as a whole, and we're people. And that is, we are earthly minded. And so when we hear things, we read it, we hear it, we read it, we see it through the, the, the hermeneutic, the guise, the, the interpretive lens of earthliness. Does it make sense? And Jesus comes back and he doesn't really give a whole lot of um, concept to this. He just responds with the same things because guys, you, you need to think spiritual here. Life comes through faith. It doesn't come through that earthly bread that you're eating. You're, you're, you're thinking bread. All you're doing is thinking bread. Give me, give me my next meal. Give me my next meal. Give me my next meal. You need to stop thinking about your next meal. This is hard and hard to do on a Sunday when we're getting ready to have a fellowship dinner, right? You should be thankful that we have two separate buildings. And right now, the, 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 the kitchen isn't right next door and, and you're smelling. I know Marsha's made um, pork loin, cut them into pork chops with sauerkraut. It was smelling good when we came to church. I'm glad. Now, if you don't like sauerkraut, it might not smell good to you at all. But for me, in that car, that car smelled wonderful. On, on, on the way here, you know, and it was just starting to cook. And I can't imagine if, if we got the kitchen right next door and everything's kind of wafting in, everybody's stomachs are going. Grrr. And I almost had Marsha make fresh bread, unloving bread for the, for the communion today, since we're talking about Jesus being the bread of life. And, but that kind of makes you grumble too, you know, when you start to smell it and to see it, and you're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but anyways, but that's, that's, but that's who we are. Do you get it? And that's what Jesus is saying. Look, your fathers ate the, the manna in the wilderness, and what happened? They still died. They're dead. How anticlimactic is that? They had a mar miraculous event happening to them every single day for 40 years. How many quail? 14.6? 14.6 billion quail coming through the camp, and they're dead. God didn't put anything special in the manna. God didn't put anything special in the, in the quail. They didn't live eternally because they ate heavenly bread or a heavenly quail. They still what? They still died. Life only comes through faith. But then he comes to the very end here, and he makes a statement. Verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Life 
comes through death. Life ultimately comes through death. That ought to blow your brain. Now, first and foremost, it comes through the death of Jesus Christ. It's through his death that we have ultimate life. Because Jesus died and he raised from the dead, conquering death, giving us true life. But now, death no longer is an end. It's only a portal to true ultimate life. You must partake of the plan of God for the payment of your sins. That plan includes our atonement through the blood of sacrifice of Jesus. And so Jesus's point here in all this illustration is, yes, God gave manna to your fathers. He fed them. He provided for them. He gave them sustenance. He gave them provision. He took care of them all the way till the what? What do we call that place? The promised land. And in the promised land, he took care of them in a, a different way, okay? So, but they had a, and there's a spiritual analogy of that, right? They left Egypt and God took them and delivered them into the promised land. They had to cross the river Jordan. And so over years, spiritually, even biblically, the, the river Jordan has taken on the persona of what? Death. And so we come through the wilderness of life. God leads us out of sin through the wilderness of life across the Jordan of death into the promised land. Do you, do you see the, the analogy that's there? Okay. So, so in this, then, Jesus is saying, look, so just as your parents, just as your fathers, they had to follow the plan of God. Yes? So what happens if they go out in the morning, they're hungry, and they, 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 they disdain the manna, which they did become disdainful of, right? What happens? They were hungry. I'm tired of eating quail. They were hungry. Now, what actually started happening even more, this is extrapolating from what Jesus said. I'm going to read more into it. But what did happen when they really started murmuring and disputing and complaining a lot? Anybody remember? Snakes. God sent them fiery serpents. And that's when John 3, we already looked at this with Nicodemus when God told Moses to put, take the metal snake and put it on the pole and put it in the middle of the, uh, the camp. It's kind of cool stuff. So even there, God gave a plan and a provision, right? And people had to do what? Continue to follow the plan and provision of God. And if they didn't, they died. Do you get the point? Jesus is saying, look, you're not the end all here. You don't get to determine the plan. You don't get to tell me, make me bread. This isn't all about you. You're not the center of the universe. You have to follow the plan like God set forth the plan. You got to participate in the provision that God has provided for you. If you don't want it, don't take it. God's given you a choice, a free will. How cool is that? But those who believe, they got it. They get it. They get life eternal, but you have to be willing to die to yourself in order to ultimately find true life. And so in Luke chapter nine, we read that Jesus said, if any man wants to come after me, he needs to deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For what is, what is it gained the man if he gains the world and yet loses his so, do you get it? What are you willing to lose in order to come to Jesus? If you're willing to lose your life, you will, Jesus said, find it. Now, I got to do a real quick um, get away from this because I got to deal with one theological um, thing because Jesus said in this passage, you need to eat um, the, the bread which I give as my flesh which I shall give for the life of the world, verse 52. Then Jesus, then the Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Verse 53, then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. 
For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I am and I in him. So we have this, we're getting ready to have communion. And so there are, um, there are religious groups that mistranslate this. Again, we're doing this whole thing in context. What Je what's Jesus talking about? He's talking about his death, right? I mean, this is all pretty clear. You got to really participate in what he's done. This is the plan and provision of God. You got to participate in all these things. But they take this couple verses straight from it, and they say, you need to eat of his body and drink of his blood. And so the first thing is what's called transubstantiation. No test at the end. If this is too much for you, just let it go. Okay. For those of you who have Catholic relatives and, and you and you minister to them, you want to pay attention and understand. Okay. When when you go to um, communion at a Catholic church, this is what they believe. Okay. If they believe in transubstantiation. It's the belief that the bread and wine are miraculously transformed into the body and blood of Jesus, although their appearances remain the same. Okay. So trans changing of the substance. Okay. So though it looks like bread, though it looks like wine, it's no longer bread and wine. It literally is the, the the body of Jesus, and it literally is the blood of Jesus. So when you put the wafer in your mouth, you're not putting a, a, a bready substance in your mouth, you're actually putting flesh, cannibalism, you're putting flesh in your mouth. That's what, when you go to a Catholic church, that's what you really need to understand. That's what they believe. This is what you mean. When you drink of the cup, you're really drinking, literally drinking blood of Jesus, like blood was sapped out of his vein, put into a cup, you're drinking blood, cannibalism. Okay, that's what they believe. That's why, Michela, did you guys ever get a cup or did you always just get the bread? Only the priest got the cup, okay? Because there was enough blood in the flesh for the people, for the, for the normal guy, okay? But, but the priest got the, 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 the flesh and the blood. I'm not quite sure because Jesus said, you need to eat of both my flesh and my blood in order to have a part. And yet they withheld the blood I mean, if that's what you believe, right? Not you, but if that's what they believe, right? You think that they should get what? They should get both, okay? Is that what Jesus is saying here? Clearly no, okay? Jesus is giving an analogy. So we take this literally. I understand the passage literally. I believe in translating the Bible literally. This is literally a figure of speech. Do you get, I mean, this is important, important for us to understand. Figures of speech are taking things literally. If something is meant as an allegory, it's written as an allegory, it is wrong for me to allegorically, to, 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 to not see it as an allegory. Makes sense? I've got to be able to understand it literally, uh, how the person portraying the picture is meaning it, okay? In the greater context, Jesus is talking about flesh. M remember, earthly. They're thinking earthly. They're thinking this, right? So now, if I then take this as Jesus literally talking about his flesh in his blood how am i thinking earthly do you get it that's kind of the boggling thing to me it's like context wise jesus is basically saying you need to stop thinking physically you need to stop looking at you got to understand there's spiritual implications behind this and and so the whole problem here we're going to see this with the, the 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 consternation of the believers in a moment where they are struggling with this okay because that's how they're hearing it. That's what they're seeing. That's what they're understanding. Mm, mm, I can't do that. I mean, how often are we going to bite on Jesus and start chunking off him? And I mean, how much can there be? I mean, I know that sounds really kind of weird, but that's what almost what they're thinking. How can we eat his body? I mean, how can we eat his flesh? How can we drink his blood? I mean, this is really kind of weird. I mean, this makes no sense at all. And Jesus says, no, you guys are missing it. So transubstantiation, they're missing it. Well, there are then those coming through the reformed movement, right, from the Reformation, when they were reforming the Catholic Church. You need to understand this, okay? The Reformation was not about starting something new. It was about reforming the Roman Church. So they changed some of the things, but they, they didn't want to change a lot of the stuff. So um, I'm not going to talk about infant baptism, but I can tell you that Martin Luther didn't believe in infant baptism, okay? He didn't baptize his own kids, okay? It wasn't until Frederick of Augsburg said, look, if you don't if you if you go that far, man, I'm not supporting your reform movement because at that time when they when they baptized infants, they didn't just baptize them into the church or whatever; they baptized them into the nation. So it was you were dealing with a political thing at that point, so you couldn't go there. In the same manner, coming out of it, well, okay, transubstantiation is not right, but wow, we hate to really get rid of this this whole thing, you know. And so they went with what's called consubstantiation, con meaning with, 
with substance, okay? And literally this means it's the belief that the body and blood of Christ coexists in and with the elements of communion. The difference between transubstantiation and consubstantiation is that those who believe in consubstantiation believe that the bread and the wine retain their nature. So even though it's, it's, it's a wafer and it's wine, Jesus is still in it. So when you participate in it, you're still eating and drinking Jesus. Okay. Now I put on here what the Bible says. We don't have time to go into it, but I want to challenge you to read those because Luke 22 is the is Jesus' last supper. Okay. And what he says, this is my this is my bread, right? Takes the bread. This is my bread. And um 1 Corinthians 10, 16, 21 talks about um about with the idols that you can't participate in the table of idols, table of demons, in the table of Christ. You can't drink of the, the, the cup of demons in the cup of Christ. And then 1 Corinthians 11, okay, is the, the challenge for us where Paul was reminding everybody of what Jesus did in the Last Supper. But he then says, and I, keep, I take it all the way to verse 30, because there is the warning to us that, that some of you are eating and drinking of the body and blood of the Lord in an unworthy manner, and therefore some are sick and some are even dying. And so I don't want to, even though I don't have time really to go there right now, I want you to focus on that. I want you to pay attention to it because there is, though we don't believe in transubstantiation, we don't believe in consubstantiation, I do want to state this, that there is a spiritual significance to what we're getting ready to do. There's a massive spiritual significance. I don't, I don't take this lightly. And, and so there's part of me that I would rather have us have communion every Sunday or every week, uh, Saturday night, Sunday morning, whatever. Okay, I'd, I'd like it. I'd like to do it weekly. And yet I recognize the fact that sometimes when you do things too often, you begin to take them what? For granted. This isn't to be taken for granted. That's why we, why in our services, we, we, we do things different on that first Sunday where we have a devotional going toward it. That's why today, you know, I could have done this message last week, but we kind of swapped it how we did it so that Today, I would be dealing with this subject since they were right next to each other. So we could have this entire time to focus on what Jesus has really done for us, okay? This is important to us. There's a spiritual significance to it. Baptism, there's a spiritual significance to baptism, okay? And that's why Peter says, when they said, what must we do to be saved? He said, repent and be baptized. There's a spiritual significance to it, not to be taken lightly. Sometimes I think that on our end of things, we take these things as, well, we don't want to just make them into the... the what the Catholic Church has done, and so we react the other way, but we got to be careful we don't do that. These are spiritual expressions of faith that God takes serious when we do it. So when we distribute the, the, the juice, we distribute the, the, the matzah, this isn't cookies and colloid. This isn't just for everybody to have a snack, okay? So I want to challenge you that. I mean, it, it's not for your kids to participate unless they're saved, and they've been baptized, okay? It's, 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 it's not just something we, it's, it's something that believers participate in. And if there's sin in you, unconfessed sin, I challenge you not to participate in it, okay? So move on, because now we have this consternation of the disciples, okay? What was their offense? Well, exactly this. They come back then in verse, um, sorry. Um, turn to page, Bob, verse 16. Yeah, verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Okay, Jesus says, you need to eat of my body and drink of my blood. For whoever eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood has eternal life. His disciples, then, they have a hard time. And Jesus says in verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself the disciples, what? complained. This is the exact same word about the Jews earlier. The Jews complained. This is the exact same one. So his disciples, these aren't just the generic Jews. These are his disciples. Now, not necessarily are these the apostles, okay? But anybody who was following after him was considered to be a disciple, okay? You need to understand that, okay? So there were those who were following him at this moment that were seen to be as disciples, right? And they got a problem. They're struggling with this. And so Jesus says, what's your problem? You know, and so he, he brings it a quick. And so the offense is eating his flesh. They were thinking physically and not spiritually. But Jesus' response then to them was that, verse 61, 
when he knew that they were complaining, he said, does this offend you? And I'm going to come back to the word offend in a moment. What then, if you should see the son of man ascend where he was before, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Okay. This is all spiritual. You guys are thinking physical again. Change the way you think. It's the spirit who gives life. You're, you're not getting this because you're not focused on the, the spirit. You're not thinking spiritually. Now, the word offense is the, is the Greek word skandalizo, okay? Uh, we bring it into the English as scandalized. It's a scandal, okay? And so years ago, um, there were different preachers who fell into scandals, right? And there were a lot of people who did what? fell with them because their eyes were focused on a man. And so when that man fell, their faith was scattered. Does it make sense? Okay. So these people, Jesus says, you need to be able to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And at that moment, there was a scandal. The teacher in front of them was scandalized, if you would. Okay. He said something that became scandalous. All the people were hearing him, and they're thinking, what? This doesn't make any sense. This is, this is wrong. This isn't. And so people then were scandalized. They were caused to stumble, caused to be offended, caused to be, caused to be scandalized with him from the perspective, because what they heard made no sense to them, because they were thinking what? Physically. Have you ever read God's word and you didn't get it? I'm still waiting for that one person who can come to me and fully explain to me the triunity of God. I'm still waiting for that one person who can come to me and explain to me fully how the predestination of God and the, and the foreknowledge of God come together. I'm still waiting for that one person who comes to me and explains to me how God worked his miraculous work in my heart so that I would choose to be saved. I've been saved now for 37 years, and I still don't get it. I know the change. I see the change, and I praise the Lord for the change. But how did it happen that night when I was laying in my bed, and I rolled out, and I went over to the Papa's on chair in my den, and I cried out my eyes and said, God, if you can save this wicked soul, I'm yours. And a transaction was made. I don't think the transaction was made in my papa's on chair. I think the transaction was made as I was rolling out of the bed. It was just verbalized by me in the papa's on chair. And it was realized by me in the days ahead or the, the days after that, since that point. Does that make sense? But there was something else that was going on. There was something going on even before I got into my bed. I mean, when, when I felt like my heart was bursting and I was going to go to hell when I died. There was something going on between the heavenly and the earthly. What amazing, marvelous, miraculous workings that God does in our life every single day. And we miss it. So what do you do when you come to those portions of scripture? When you don't get it? When God says something, like, I don't know, something like, you know, um, God said, let there be light. And there was light. Oh, that's, that's kind of cool. That's kind of neat. And then, you know, then God said, let the water separate from the waters. And so the water separated from waters, and he called it, you know, firmament, the sky. That's kind of cool, too. It was day two. It was evening, it was morning, day two. And then God said, let the water separate from the waters and the dry ground appear and let the, the vegetation come on that. And, you know, and so there was the vegetation, everything produced after its kind. And that's kind of cool because it was the evening, there was a the morning, it was the third day. Then God said, what? Let there be a sun. Wait. We had light back on day one. We had vegetation growing on day three. And let there be a moon. But wait, we had, we had all this going on and, and stars. So the sun, the moon, and the stars weren't created until day four so that they could be 
for signs and seasons and days and wonders. Do you understand that? How did he do that? Do we revolve around the sun or don't we? If the earth existed before the sun existed, how did that play out? Scientists have to explain it. It's a guess. I don't have to guess. God said it. I believe it. That settles it for Bob. Does it make sense? It may not settle for you. That's where I come to my, I came to that point in Genesis chapter one. That was my primary crisis of faith. I had to make a decision because it made no sense to the scientific brain. None. I can't marry it with, with evolution at all. No such thing as theistic evolution. Get rid of it. They don't marry, cannot marry, will not marry. You can't have death before sin. And if you do, it has nothing to do with the wages of sin. Do you get what I'm saying? And the hallmark of it is God created a son on day four. It makes no sense. One day I'm looking forward to finding out how it all played out. Because you know what? In that new heaven and new earth, there's no sun and there's no moon. Because God himself is going to be the light. How cool is that? But you only get it if you're willing to think spiritually and not physically. If you're willing to let God be God and not give an account to you. How cool is that? So, their offense. In the end, the confirmation. Very quickly here at the end. This is so exciting. I mean, I think this is the culmination of the whole thing. Verse 68. You know, verse 66, I'm going to start verse 66. From that time, many disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and what? Know that you are the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. How cool is that? Justin and I were talking about this the other day, and they finally came back to what, what, um, what we were talking about earlier. They, they weren't getting it, right? Peter gets it. Peter's able to get it at this moment, right? But he doesn't get it. But he gets it. And he gets it. He doesn't always have to get it. <laughs> Do you get it? Sorry. Had to go. I had to go there. I don't have to understand. I just have to believe what he told me. And he did enough to prove that it was true. And that's what Peter said. <laughs> oh, yeah, I get it. I get it, Jesus. We're supposed to eat of your flesh and drink your blood. Oh, yeah, I get it. It's all spirit. He didn't say that. He's kind of there in the camp with these other guys. This isn't making sense. But where else am I going to go? Who else am I going to turn to? You have the words of eternal life. And then Jesus, this final confession, I chose you all knowing that, and yes, that's Southern. You didn't know that Jesus was Southern. And I chose you all knowing that one of you is a diabolos, a slanderer, but translated devil, could be. But generally when it's talking about Satan or the devil, there's a, a definite article with it. There's no definite article here. And so if you read First Timothy and Titus, in different places where you have the qualifications of a, um, a, um, a deacon and the qualification of the elders and stuff like that, when it says that they're not slanderers, it's the word diabolos, okay? So it's translated as a slanderer. They're not as a devil, they, you know? So we don't want a deacon's wife to have, yeah, have a devil. And so well, that kind of makes sense, huh? And so, but they don't translate it that way. They just want, don't want a deacon's wife to be a slanderer. Well, that kind of makes sense too. So whether, whether this should be translated slanderer or whether it should be translated a devil, it doesn't matter when we, we, later we know that Satan entered into Judas. Does that make sense? And he slandered Jesus. He turned him in. He gave him an accusation against him. So however you play that out, it doesn't matter to me. The point is, this is early on in Jesus' ministry. Think about this. This isn't just before he's getting ready to die. This is way early in his ministry. And he's already declaring to them, I chose you. I chose you. Remember, to go back to the last week. I'm not going to go back to it. I chose you. And I chose you knowing that one of you is going to fulfill this. So in the end, again, who is Jesus to you? Are you truly willing to partake of his death? In order that you can have ultimate life, 
what does that commitment mean to you? I challenge you to, to really meditate upon that this week, to think about that. In Luke 9, this is where it's at. I thought it was earlier, but it's in this, and I don't have time to read it now then. But if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And so you'll note each of the colors there, because there's so much that's in here. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and himself is destroyed? And whoever is ashamed of me in my words, the Son of Man will also be ashamed. How do you respond when there are passages of scripture which are hard for you to understand? And finally then, is there a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? 